Hey guys, this is Eleanor from Revolution. We are here at La Reserve with the Philips team, including Alex Godby, a man we don't need to introduce anymore, even though he's the Continental Europe and Middle East director of Philips Watches. The upcoming auctions of this weekend, Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m., are going to unveil extraordinary pieces, including five that we're going to talk about today, starting with George Daniels, Christian Craigs, but also a Patek Philippe, a Vacheron Constantin, and a Rolex Daytona Lemon Dial, which we're going to explain a little later. But if we start with the George Daniels, what is quite extraordinary and unique is that it's the first time that you have three wrist watches at the same place at the same time. Do you have any idea how that happened? Um, Eleanor, hi. Great to have you with us. And uh, how did it happen? Well, it's, it all happened very easily, to be honest, but we're very lucky. We, had the, we first obtained the, the tourbillon, the unique piece tourbillon, which I'm going to show you. And just talking with a few collectors, uh, then the anniversary came in, then the millennium, and we had the full uh, uh, golden or um, golden trinity of, of, of the George Daniels uh, wristwatches. So we're very lucky, honored to have uh, such such a collection. And I think it's it's a great opportunity for for people, for watch enthusiasts, to come to Geneva, to come to the exhibition, and to see these and pieces. See because Daniels. once they're gone, they're gone, and there are chances that you'll see three George Daniels wristwatches together again are very low. Because just to give a little heads up, George Daniel produced less than, what, 50, 100 pieces? So George Daniels by himself, with his hands, he made uh, 27 uh, pocket watches, two wrist watches, then with his uh, apprentice, uh, Roger Smith, he made two more um, unique wristwatch tourbillons, 35 anniversaries in yellow gold, and 48 millenniums in yellow gold. So we have kind of the holy grail of what can be seen at auction at the same place that I can actually be touched. I'm not going to touch it because I'm not allowed to, but you will explain <laughs> what you're currently wearing on your wrist. Well, what I have the pleasure and honor of wearing on my wrist is George Daniel's personal watch. When he decided to make a wristwatch, he decided to, to create a piece which reflects totally his, um, his vision and his philosophy. Which so, is? which is purely handmade and everything made by himself. He makes the dials, the movements, the cases, everything. And everything has to have a meaning and a reason. Like so, a historical background where there's a story behind it that he wants to tell or that people are eager to say. He always said that he needs a watch to have quality and to be amusing. Okay. And this ticks those two boxes. One thing is you look at it and it looks like a beautiful time-only watch with a, a power reserve. But what he did is he created a very interesting case where you press a button, the case pops open, and you can see the tourbillon and the day and the date. So, and then you just clip it back. And nobody and knows what's happening. It's just a thicker knows. case, but you don't really know what's happening. Exactly, and that's what where it's very smart because nobody's gonna take their watch off every time they want to see the tourbillon or the day and the date. So by having this little button here, you open it and you, you click open it back. and close it. And so this is a watch that he made in the early 1990s. And he liked it so much that he kept it for himself. And he finally sold it in 2005 to a, a gentleman who was not a watch collector, who had seen a, one of George Daniels um, a, a documentary on the BBC on George Daniels and he fell in love with the guy and he went to see George Daniels Mr. Daniels please make me a watch no go away second date Daniels please go away I'm gonna call the police etc <laughs> at one point they became friends yeah you're, you're a stalker go away you're scaring me but they became friends and 13 years later he finally said you know what this is it you've been waiting for this for 13 years you can I can here it is here it is he didn't give it to him he sold it of to course him. of course of course um, and so this is the very first time this watch is coming to the auction market in 30 years. So actually, it was made exactly in 92. So 30 years ago, this watch was made. It was his own watch. And now it's coming to the auction for the very first time. And how do you estimate a price or a bid on, a, on such a unique, historically filled piece and, and just never seen? That is the million uh, dollar question. You can't. What you, what, 
what is what is a Modigliani painted by Modigliani and put in his living room worth? That is a painting that he loved so much. What is and don't forget, George Daniels is the first modern watchmaker to put his own name on the dial. Everybody else was working for brands. So he is basically the grandfather of independent watchmaking. Without George Daniels, maybe there would be no Jean, maybe there would be no Recep Recepi. I don't know. So imagine he invented a genre as well. So not only he invented a genre, it's his own watch, it's unique. We put an estimate of in excess of one million. Mm -hmm because anything lower would Doesn't just not make, make sense. sense. But that's where the market will have to decide uh, what they think such a unique and historically important and beautiful watch is worth. So we'll know more on Saturday because it is part of part one of the Phillips auction for this weekend. Exactly, so in slot 27. So you better start early then. We're starting at two o'clock Geneva time and I think this watch will come under hammer around 3.30. Perfect. So now moving on to another kind of genius in its own uh, workshop, which is Christian Krings, um, who puts really like his, his nail on the fact that he doesn't want to use any computer. He wants to draw everything by hand, pencil, pen, paper. And it comes down to a pocket watch that you're introducing and unveiling here for the for the, for the auction. So what's the story behind this kind of eclectic German watchmaker? So Klings is probably one of the greatest watchmakers that nobody has ever heard of. <laughs> At least... <laughs> unless, Another hidden gem. <laughs> exactly. Unless you're a total watch geek and a watch nerd. He's, um, he started in the 1980s. Uh, he was, uh, he's an East German. And he started watchmaking because it was the only job that he could do independently and have your own workshops and not controlled by the government, by the government. that happened. Exactly. Okay. So he started watchmaking. Then he uh, moved to, actually to California and that's where he made his first wristwatch. And he was thinking of uh, becoming a psychi uh, psychologist okay. uh, and he won a prize for that watch that he had made and he said, okay, so I'm now going to become a full-time watchmaker and make watches for others before he was restoring. He moved back to Germany after the um, fall of the, the wall, so in early 2000s actually, and to start making watches with his own name. And in the past 30 years, he's made 33 watches. Uh, as you said, nothing with computers. He de designs everything pencil and paper, and everything is done by hand. He does not have machines. So you can tell in the making, the different watch components have some time his signature to some extent because it has the imperfections of handmade okay. which gives it so much uh, charisma and beauty there there is that little thing and here he created this is one of his it's actually his only uh, tourbillon pocket watch okay and it's a detent escapement self starting so the detent escapement in other words in other words <laughs> the detent escapement is a chronometer escapement which is known for its incredible accuracy However, there's two things which are kind of uh, special for the detent escapement is when you wind the watch, mm -hmm. you need to give it a little shake for the movement to start. To start. To start. Here it's self-starting, so once you, um, you wind the movement, it starts automatically. That's a big deal because nobody's ever managed to do that. And secondly, it's shock absorbent. Um, uh, detent Which is important for pocket watch because it's moving all the exactly, time. Exactly, and a detent so escapement, as soon as there's the uh, slightest shock, it stops. Here it doesn't. So he created this phenomenal watch with a moon phase, with the power reserve and the, and the seconds. And it's, uh, it's number two. So it's... it's, it's so it's, another high estimate for that one. Um, no, uh, we put 60 to 120,000 uh, Swiss francs. We think it's worth more, uh, but once again, we like the fact that the market decides what a piece is worth. And one last question before we move on to the next uh, wristwatches. What's the trend in pocket watches right now? So pocket watches for many because years... Because people steal wristwatches, maybe pocket <laughs> watches are a bit harder. <laughs> exactly. No, I think pocket watches, uh, interestingly, at least at Philips, we really concentrate on 20, 20th and 21st century. Okay. And the pocket watches that we've had and the ones that we see that do well are, uh, let's say, 
complicated pocket watches, perpetual calendars, mm -hmm. um, tourbillons, and more and more pocket watches made by independent um, contemporary makers like Dufour, Grand Sonnerie we had last year, the Klings, uh, we have an Urban Jurgensen made by Derek Pratt. So those are actually doing quite well, but the, I would say the Urban Jorgensen, it's 60 millimeters, so it wouldn't really fit in your vest. You would need to put it in your in your pants pocket Jacket or something. Armor isn't a lot. Exactly, exactly. But I think pocket watches, it's still a very niche um, market niche for market. that. Yeah. So, so now if we're moving on to a less niche branded market, obviously we're going to start with the Patek Philippe and the Refn 1436, if yes. I'm not mistaken. And it's quite a unique piece, not only because it's in Pingol with a champagne dial, but the intricacy and the detail of the, of the dial is quite extraordinary. How, and if I'm not mistaken, there's only one of this. Yep, you're, you're correct. First of all, the 1436, it's is. a tiny diameter, it's a 33. It's a 33, but it doesn't uh, feel uh, small on the, on the wrist because it has quite lo uh, long lugs. And a thicker case. And a thicker case extent. because it's a split seconds. And a split seconds is, it's kind of a, uh, sounds like a weird complication for, a lot, for many because it's just a chronograph with an extra hand. But that extra hand makes, makes it so <laughs> difficult. That extra hand actually adds one or two zeros to the, to the price. And a split seconds, when you speak to watchmakers, it's as complicated, or maybe it's the second most complicated after a chiming watch. So it shows you how difficult it is to make. Yeah. And to put it in such a tiny case, and not a very thick case, that's quite a feat. Now this uh, piece is from the 1940s. Pink gold, super rare, and as you said, the fact that it has a champagne dial, which normally was reserved for the yellow gold models, makes it unique. So that was a special order. It was probably a special order because it's a, it's a champagne dial, but nevertheless has pink gold indexes. So we know it was made specifically for this watch, and it was confirmed and is confirmed by the by the extract. So it, it probably was um, commissioned by a by a long-standing Patek. Uh, a collector. It's an absolutely fascinating and lovely watch. Then if we stay in the champagne dial, we have the Cosmograph Daytona with the lemon dial, which is one of the other grail from the Paul Newman series. It's reference 6264. Yeah. Um, and it has quite, as you said, the fuck you watch. <laughs> How come? I said that in, in private, but yes, exactly. It's totally decadent. I mean, it's yellow on yellow. It's an incredible watch. With a hint of black, which makes it even like which has a hint modern of, Art Deco touch to it. It has a hint of black, and this one actually has the outer register and the sub counters, which are turning tropical brown. So it's. I mean, there's a lot, not a lot going on, but there's a cavalcade of details that make this watch just the ultimate. With some sort of like Roman numerals inside each counters, which is also very different from the regular uh, Daytona counters and, and numbers that we see. Actually, it's uh, Arabic numbers. Arabic, sorry. <laughs> Roman, Arabic. Yeah, Arabic. Yeah, though no, that's what makes the Paul Newman so, so special. They, they used to call it the exotic dial uh, when exactly. it first came out. And it was a total commercial flop. Nobody wanted them. That's why they're so rare. And on top of it, Rolex didn't make gold watches because these were actually, you know, like beater watches. They were not made. They were made to be worn and just not take cared for. And the fact that they made them in yellow gold makes them rare. So here you have Paul Newman, yellow gold, and what we call the lemon dial because this really deep lemony uh, look with the white um, uh, index colors. It's totally a super cool. And also the bracelet watch. is super like supple. Like yeah. to wear it doesn't feel like it's an actual full gold watch. Which no, because these were uh, hollowed uh, at the time. Now per Rolex uh, makes them lighter, full gold full and gold. it's like really heavy. But there is just so so pleasant to, to wear. It's such a cool watch. And I'm not. And this is coming from a guy who's not a Rolex guy. Okay. And this will be sold in the second part of the auction on Sunday. Yes, lot 161 and the estimate is 550 to 1 million Swiss francs. Start your bid now. <laughs> <laughs> the rarity. Last but not least, uh, way more classic, way more, um, I want to say, subtle, but also super elegant because very thin case, 
but also very different because the indexes are diamonds with two different sizes, which are two different cut, baguette and brilliant cut. Yeah. Why did you like so much that Vacheron reference? First of all, it is such a cool watch. It's such a stealth watch. And if you see it from afar, you just say, okay, nice, cool, two-hand watch. You look at it closer, it has the diamonds. I love that classic with a twist thing. And it has this tiny little on trigger the side, on the exactly. side, which makes it a, um, a minute repeater. And only three it's just of- Just like this on the side. Exactly. So this is just a, this is like in your face, this is just for yourself. And there's only three of these known. Three actually unique pieces of this okay. reference. All in white metal, one in platinum with the diamond indexes, one in white gold with baton indexes, and the third one, which is this one, which is white, white gold, gold with the diamond. diamonds. Exactly. And the sound is just incredible. So you have three, four totally different watches, but which cover an incredible, um, rich period and uh, it's different styles of watchmaking, which makes watches so interesting because there's something really for everyone. So what is great is that with the two auctions that are going to be happening this coming Saturday and Sunday, you're going to cover a wide range of historical pieces, unique pieces, extraordinary pieces, and also very interesting from their style, their look, their history, and the year they were born to some extent. Um, thank you so much for sharing those anecdotes and good luck. Thank what's you. What's going to happen this weekend? Crossing fingers. Looking and forward toast. to seeing you uh, <laughs> in the auction room. Absolutely. I'll be delighted. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, Eleanor.